the, the title of the session this afternoon is The Role of the Media. And um, I, I'm going to do a very brief introduction um, because I think the speakers will be known to most people in the room. And um, uh, so, first of all, Shireen Ahmed, uh, known to most of us from her blog, Tales of a Hijabi Footballer, um, and also somebody who we all follow on Twitter. Uh, Jennifer Doyle, Professor of English at the University of California. Um, for many years, um, Tales from Leckwing, um, and then the new blog, The Sports Spectacle. Um, Sarah Girk is Managing Media Relations and Social Media for the Washington Spirit, uh, one of the uh, National Women's Soccer League team. Um, Sarah is a prolific writer for a number of websites, uh, including the Soccer Wire. And uh, then Monica Gonzalez uh, has been an ESPN soccer commentator since 2011 um, and also well known as a, as a player. So, uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Um, just to get us um, uh, going this afternoon, I've just uh, circulated a document that was first given out to the um, organisers of the first Women's World Cup in 1991 and um, it's uh, deliberately, the handout is deliberately in the wrong order, it starts with page three, goes to page one and then page two um, and, and then the, the famous um, saying by Seth Blatter, the future is feminine um, and one of the reasons that I circulated the, these documents this afternoon is just to get us to think about when FIFA are um, imagining what a women's world championship might look like when they're having their own um, I input to to mediate women's football. How do they imagine that looking in China in 1991? And uh, you could see that the um, theme that they chose is unity, friendship, and progress. Um, lots of fireworks and um, the theme of the phoenix, which is meant to symbolise both. Um, feminine beauty and kind of new start, which is particularly appropriate given that they nearly killed women's football on uh, <laughs> Well, not FIFA, but FIFA. Yeah. So, so the phoenix was that symbol, and uh, if we have the the Jules Rimet trophy for, for men's football, this is a very um, uh, early indication of how FIFA imagined the Women's World Championship might look. So that's just something really to take away and kind of reflect mm -hmm. on. Don't want to take away uh, from anything that our uh, uh, presenters have to say this afternoon. Um, so I've been asked to start with with three questions really for the panel, and I'll begin with the first one. Um, what kind of role can today's media, both mainstream outlets and alternative spheres, including social media, play in supporting women's soccer? Uh, anybody want to go first? <laughs> anybody want to start us off? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start off. Um, so I'm speaking from the perspective of having written about women's football for more alternative um, outlets um, online, for blogs, um, but doing things like covering the U.S. women's national team events, um, covering the National Women's Soccer uh, League, and so, you know, I'm sitting next to people, uh, very professional writers who are, uh, you know, write for places like ESPN, so there's this interesting dynamic um, in women's soccer, at least in the U.S., where you have, you know, a writer like Grant Wall, or you have these like phenomenal uh, journalists who cover, you know, the broader sport, not just women's soccer, because right now, you know, full-time women's soccer journalism journalism doesn't really exist, uh, and so, but also coming now from the side of being off, being on the media side and dealing with media requests. So I think that helping and embracing. Uh, media outlets who want to start writing about the women's game, obviously because it's not happening as much now, and giving them that education so that the stories that are being told aren't just the same stories being told over and over and over again, because often that's that's the easiest one to do, and when you're coming new to a topic, it's new to you, uh, so it gets, it gets written. So instead of having major media outlets all publishing very similar stories about Abby Wambach breaking a record, or uh, Christy Rampone's tremendous time in the game, which is so impressive. Instead of having you know five major sports publications all writing the same variation on that story, 
how can teams um, on the media side and then how can jur journalists on their side discover and tell compelling stories that's not just the same uh, recycled story over and over because I feel like as consumers and as people who are reading these stories, um, you don't get any sort of further engagement or further entrenchment into your interest into the sport if you've already read that thing five times. Nothing is new about that. Nothing is drawing you in that you didn't already have. And since there's so you know, limited coverage to begin with, to maximize that, how can, in my mindset now, is how can I help maximize that? How can I you know, make these writers aware of these good stories? How can I facilitate that? And it's not necessarily a criticism of current media coverage. It's just that, you know, it needs to be a two-way dialogue. And, it, you know, there, I think there is an opportunity there to, you know, really change uh, the, the level and type of reporting that's happening on women's soccer, at least especially in the United States. Did you want to come in? Sure. Yeah, I um, follow a bunch. Like, I write for also alternative blogs because this is shocking. Sports activists talking about women, Muslim women in sport aren't in massive demand. Um, so I will basically pitch an idea or something about women's football and or just on the level like um, I, I did some writing about the South Asian Football Federation and they had an incredible tournament like two years ago, which I thought was really incredible because you've got teams from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Pakistan all competing, and it, it, these are stories that are really important, like beyond the same recycle. Narratives and the way that it was reported in one paper, I think I can't. I think it was in Kurdistan. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, it was just like, oh, these women are combating patriarchy in their society. Um, okay, yes, but that shouldn't be the focus of the story. Nor was it the way that the players necessarily wanted to be represented. So I will hugely critique media because I mean I think there's so many different ways to be able to report on these stories, particularly of women of color around the world on a global level. And the way that it does come forward is really even within their own countries, it's not reported to the way it should be. Now there's a lot of positive media coming out, sometimes in the Middle East and South Asia specifically that I'm familiar with. But um, I'm, I'm not saying there's not huge important human stories there. Like I did a piece and I connected with an incredible group called Girls and uh, uh, Girls in Football South Africa, and they work a lot with women who are their agencies used to help women in the situations where there's targeting and of, of gay women who identify as queer footballers. And it's really like there's issues of corrective rape. And these stories aren't told in broader media. And it's these kind of stories are very relevant because they talk about football and how that's used in different communities around the world to help women empower themselves and recover from stuff. So I mean, and I wouldn't have found these people if it wasn't for social media, truthfully. Like sports activists and female journalists. I found all the people at this conference online. So media and reporting and connecting is like they're very, they're very correlated in their importance. And propelling and people encouraging each other's work, women writers. Like we see each other like, oh, she just got published here, or this, I'm gonna retweet something she said. And this is important because it helps the community of women sports writers as well. And our male allies, they also, they're encouraging us, so. Monica? Um, I think I was probably going to, your last point uh, mentioned, because even though I'm in the media now, I, I, I still struggle to call myself media. Um, and and it's pro I'm probably the worst person to be a sideline reporter and have to go, like, get info from people, because I just don't like doing that. Um, <laughs> You know, but being a player for a long time, being a player in, in you know out here in in, in Boston in the in the league in the, in the states and then in Mexico and Latin America, um, we we always have in Mexico. Everybody would always write well about us, like always write nice. And I remember in, in the last panel we heard Cindy Grello talking about when the media started like criticizing, and I think. I, I mirrored her sentiments there because in Mexico I got to the point where I'm like, I'm going to need to like criticize what we're doing and because that pushes you. Mm -hmm. And it shows that people have expectations and that they care. So I think that's like, for, to me, that's the goal. To get to the points where we're having debates and shows. And, um, and so what role does the media have in that? Well, in a way, the media has, they have to have something to write about. Mm -hmm. So I think a big part of it is the development of the sport and the evolution of the game 
um, places like Mexico, things the Federation could do is have more games so that there could be something to write about. Um, and then and then just that, with one thing that I think women have that are special is our ability to collaborate. And I think we need to utilize that to our advantage, even find a way to monetize it. From talking about grassroots level, involving corporations, involving the media, involving the federations and youth clubs if you have to, literally all in one loop. Um, so does that mean you have some sort of like a central hub that maybe a lot of women's writers and women's soccer writers are very dedicated. And there are a lot of really good writers out there that are struggling with their website. You know, even in Latin America, one of my neighbors, she writes all about women's sports because she's so passionate. There are people that are passionate about it and they do it for free. And I think that those people need to find each other and help each other out in, how, in however way that they can. Um, because these are our, our writers that are helping to push, push the boundaries and, and also helping to bring other people in. Um, to to our sport because that's something I think that the media does have the power to do. Um, you know, way before I even got into media, my little brother gave me Noam Chomsky book on media control. Like this is how we're all being controlled in this country, and I, and it's like wow. And so sometimes I'm like, you know, if you guys go out and just publish, you know, before our game that I was talking about, 110,000 people. That's because we were in the record, literally every single. And they did some obnoxious things like have us, you know, eating sushi before we played Japan, like saying things like that, but that attracted the viewers. That was kind of, they had to kind of start a little, and that's, that's, those are different things that you can do. And I think around the women's game, it lends to a lot of creativity and, 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 and a different, a different kind of market. Uh, and, and I know the women, um, you know, targeting women's soccer, you target moms, and I know a lot of businesses love to target the women. They spend 80% of the, the world's money, and they do 80% of our spending. So how can you tie that in now to potential sponsors that are looking to also target those women? For me, like, I mean, we could take, say, for example, like the uh, championship for men's basketball that's just played. Um, it'd be an interesting exercise to count how many newspaper articles were published in the say three days before the final about the match about and that were really like non-stories you know the relationships between the two coaches various players player stories in anticipation of the final what is it you know everybody hates to i mean i was like that's new that's a new story <laughs> that everybody hates to like i was like i was like this is i there was a whole espn special I think that was ESPN. That was a documentary that was about how you know everyone hates Duke. Um, and as a fan of women's sports, it 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 makes me like that character from The Exorcist. Like I, I get so angry because it's like I'm like we could. There's no reason on earth why this level of reporting or hell like 50 percent or even 30 percent of that level of media intensity couldn't be like given to. Uh, women's matches that were something besides the final of the World Cup. You know, that that kind of media intensity happens in the United States when the United States is in the final or the, the quarterfinals or the Olympics and the World Cup. That's that's just about it. Like, you won't have anything like that for um, the um, professional leagues, um, certainly not at the college level either, um, that you will find coverage within a kind of more specialized market, but not like ma mainstream sports media. Um, and um, that's to me part of that. There's that's just like ingrained sexism within the structure of these media organizations themselves. You know, but the hard thing is trying to figure out how to ask for more resources to be spent in journalism. You know, in, in a historical moment when the practice of journalism is itself feeling like it's kind of veering off a, a, a cliff towards extinction. You know, um, you know that would be like that's like an ex external material pressure that impacts the development of sports media coverage of women's sports. I say that, however, like sports sports sections are one of the few sections that, it's like, um, and print journalism, is, it'll be like the sports section that is one of the things that keeps a paper in print form. Um, so it is actually in, um, in, mass, in news media, it is one of the places that's still seen as a kind of revenue generator. Um, and um, so, like, I think women's sports gets caught in, in a rock and a hard place between the like historical moment with waning resources allocated um, to journalism in general, 
right? And then um, the structural sexism of the determination that there is no market for women's sports. You know, so you don't get like the actual like media labor of like creating a sense of a market with like you know men's football in England. I mean, geez, it's like it's like there's so many stories that are just not stories. You know, like just just pure fiction and gossip. Um, um, you know, which we eat up like candy because it is really fun to read. You know, and there's and there's just no reason that that can't that we can't be like kind of participating in more of that. Um, uh, and I would take pure fiction and gossip around the women's game. I would be I'd be psyched um, to, for that. I would I would love that. Um, and um, and that does happen in the in the blog spaces. And, you know, and then I'll say like the one happy interaction that I've had like proactive engagement from sports media, and it's really surprised me, was from like. Because every now and again, like a soccer-based site, site will an editor will reach out to me from a soccer blog and say, "Oh, we'd love to repost, reblog, you know, whatever, you know, and um, something that I've published on my blog." But um, Deadspin actually contacted me over a story that was about rape in the jujitsu community, and um, and um, like, you know, I I had no I I was kind of processing something on my blog for myself, you know, no anticipation that that would. End up on Deadspin, and it surprised me that Deadspin, an ed, Deadspin editor, was reading my blog at all, right? Um, and then they reblogged that a few days later, and and then they're like, like, "We would love to get stories from you." And I was like, "Because I don't really, I mean, I don't really think of Deadspin as some as a site that is interested in feminist perspectives on sports or writing about women's sports." But then now I pay more attention to what's going on on Deadspin. Now, mind you, like if I were dependent upon the money that I might earn from sharing uh, stories, like allowing for something to be reblogged on their Gawker media site, you know, I, I couldn't pay for lunch, never mind like my rent, you know, so um, <laughs> if I can do that, right, it's only because I have a full-time job as an academic, which seriously actually infringes upon my ability to, to do something like, you know, like if, if, if the future of media coverage of women's soccer is dependent on people like me, it's not... You know, I can't actually, my job does not allow me to do something like follow women's soccer at a constant level of attention across the academic year. I just can't, I can't do it, actually. Monica just mentioned that about how we can take women that are doing this, because I also blog independently, and what, I the office that I haven't been reached out, one piece that I wrote, I was reached out to, um, just to reblog it, I wasn't even paid for it, yeah. it was just to reblog, and what I was surprised was that people did know of my blog, but it still was no interest. And I mean, in the, in the sphere of North America, being a sports writer who's a woman of color, like that's also really, really small. There's all these are these stories that come out different stories and different perspectives, because shockingly, the sports media in North America, what we were talking about this last night, is someone said it would be underestimating to say it was 90 percent white male. That was a that was a generous estimation, and I mean, there's a lot of different stories that affect different communities. Different perspectives are really, really important, and there are bloggers out there, and you know, you can, you search. There's stuff happening. It's good that Dad's been, um, you know, it's great that Dad's been wanted to. And I've seen. I was just uh, telling Jennifer this. I saw um, on uh, like a soccer site that she'll name unnamed. Um, you can ask me after if you want. And um, they their contribution to having a woman part of their team permanently was to offer. Her suggestions for Man Crush Monday for soccer players. That that was the extent of them having a woman join their team. And I'm like, really? That's all you can come up with? Is, is this? And I mean, I, I I agree with you. Like, if you were able to buy a salad, that would be pretty awesome mm -hmm. for lunch. But you know, it's 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 bleak and being able to empower ourselves and create a space where we write and we write for free and basically we're providing free content. But it's valuable content. And I mean, this is something that needs to be picked up on. I think what's interesting about specifically the US um, media landscape is that a lot of paid journalists, uh, to, in general, uh, who have to cover more than soccer and then those that cover do soccer, you know, fight tooth and nail to get what they get just yeah. for soccer, just for men's mm -hmm. soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, so in conversations both with people who are part of and then in talking with people who, you know, are wanting to cover the National Women's Soccer League, you know, they, in a lot of cases, have worked very hard to get approval and to be able to dedicate their time, if, you know, if they are paid, to be able to do the coverage that they are. 
So while it's, it's easy to be, because I'm, I'm obviously was doing it for free as well, and feeling that frustration on the other side, there are these institutions that are controlling like individual, you know, employees and whatnot, where all the people who are around in soccer or are around in women's soccer have worked really hard just to get where they are now. So it, it's a very, it's a lot different than obviously in England where you have, you know, more coverage of the women's game, but that's because soccer is you know, the, the resources dedicated to it, the coverage of it is just so much more extensive. In the United States, it's a smaller pie, and then to try to get women's into that, you know, it's even a smaller slice of that. So I think it's an interesting um, issue that I think is a little bit unique to the United States. So, so, so given some of the challenges that you've raised so far, uh, just on a very personal level, why right? <laughs> <For one. laughs> I mean, I don't know about you guys, but every time FIFA has a press release that's flat, that flatters speaking, I need to vent about it. And that's how maybe sometimes I come across other people venting similarly. And it, there's a little community that we form online sharing sentiment and feeling, I don't know. I, I think because I enjoy it and I, I'm, I'm not an academic. So for me, my critical thinking of course you're an academic. No, I mean, like, like you, I started right. with labor rules. I do, but I, I'm not, you know, a, a professor as, as such. I mean, I, it took me a really long time to figure out to say I was a sports activist, and someone had to say, so you're a sports activist, just because I didn't feel comfortable saying I was a journalist because I didn't go to day school. So, you know, I didn't want to be have someone say, well, you're not this. I mean, you were stuck on labels anyway. So I was just like, I'm a storyteller. I tell stories. So I'm comfortable doing that because a lot of them are my own stories. So, or my own experiences, so I was comfortable doing that. But um, for me, it's to, it's a release, it's to get stuff out there. And the interesting thing is, people started to want to read my stories. And I, for my blog, the Google Analytics was, the highest readership I had for the first year of my blog was for 18 to 24 year old males in Poland. Mm. We're really interested in stories about a woman who plays football with hijab on. And I was like, what? But I'm like, I wanted to reach out to young women and sort of reach out to other women. But okay, you know, props to the guys in Poland. Thank you for making me feel like someone wanted to read my stuff. So, I don't know. I think that's a really good question. And the first thing that came to my mind was that's how it starts. I would say that's how social any social movement starts, with somebody writing about something. And sometimes it's an injustice or you're wanting to complain. Sometimes you're just informing people. And with women's soccer, it's so different everywhere you go that in a lot of ways, the hub of, I think, the place that has the most potential to change and to grow the sport is the United States. But the place that needs the most change is everywhere else. So if the everywhere else does it right, the messages won't get back to the people in the States who are people like, you know, Joanna Loman and Leanna Sanderson that are, they're still playing and they have been working overseas trying to grow the sport. Um, so I think awareness is a big part of it, passing information. Um, and then and then when you get when we get more developed in the sport and you have now your beats and things going on, that just lends to all different kinds of creative little shows and things that you can do around the sport. But I think that the women are the stories. I think when you when you start to know, get to know, these girls, not just from the States, but from all over the world and their stories. Um, I'm actually personally very sad that Maribel Dominguez isn't playing because she's she's one of my heroes. Um, and I mean, she's a steel from me. <laughs> and that's just from where she grew up. When she, the, the, way, the, play, the way that she grew up, the, the dirt floors, uh, her mom knocking door to door. And I'm telling the story now, which is not going to be in the World Cup anymore. Um, how she got to be successful and the most famous player in the country and she scored more goals than everybody else put together with no support and a dad telling her she couldn't play so she had to lie every single time she came home where were you um and i think people need to know those stories so i think that's one thing we'll see this summer i know fox is trying to focus on on that a lot and telling those stories because these are the women that that are going to lead the social movement mm -hmm. i mean I've, I've, uh, her, like, she's a great, she's like one of the reasons I write, you know, it's just like when um, I first learned about her as a player, like, I was just like, I just wanted to know more, 
and I haven't written I've never written next to nothing about her anymore. But it's just like that sometimes you just come across these stories where you just know there's more there and you're just hoping that if you stay if you share a little bit of what you know, what you're able to find out that maybe it'll allow someone else to also kind of carry it forward. Um, you know, so that the story can actually be developed. I mean like I mean, I, that's, a, that's a part for me, like, about, like, a why, like, just, to, for example, the lawsuit that players filed, you know, like, I don't feel like that story has really been told, like, because for me, like, just thinking about, like, an in, individual athletes playing at the national level, right, um, so individual international women athletes making the decision to put their name on a lawsuit is a huge thing. I mean, there's, like, there's every incentive to not do that. Right. Um, you know, there's no way that those women thought they were going to win that. Right. I mean, I'm just like you're going up against FIFA. You're it's like relatively short time span before the tournament. Eventually, that's why the case fell apart is because they couldn't get an expedited process in the court system. <coughs> so it became kind of moot that the players would have had to actually have done a, a staged a boycott. And um, athletic boycotts uh, led by athletes, right, are very, very rare. Like even the most famous, the Olympic Project for Human Rights. Um, uh, which was in the lead up to the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, you know, that was a, a nationwide effort at a boycott movement led by black male athletes. Um, and it's very organized and a lot happened and they actually affected a lot of change. But what did not happen was a boycott. You know, a couple athletes stayed home, but uh, they were basketball players who had, where their participation in the Olympics wasn't going to be the very, the only thing that would maintain the possibility of having a professional life as an athlete, right? And, so, I, and I think one thing to, you, you just kind of, kind of commented on it just a little bit, but one of the things too about covering women's sports is maybe the we don't have as much money to to go in and do the right proper investigating. And I was just if with with the Terps lost the, the lawsuit, if there was some way that we could get like sixty minutes or twenty twenty or one of those investigative shows to go and do a real investigation. I think I think what and not just with FIFA, but different national teams, different federations. It, I think it would like disgust people to know what really goes on. Because there was a whole retaliatory retaliatory dimension that was added to the complaint. That was like a there was like a, a part two of it, right? That there was a I forget the numbers of athletes who first signed on to the complaint, but it was pretty significant. And then um, stories started to emerge that national federations were, for example, they the word was that the that France had been threatened, that if they, if their players continued to participate in the suit, that France wouldn't be given the bid for the next Women's World Cup. And none of the Canadian players were allowed to sign. Yeah, I mean, like <laughs> that, like from an organization that purports to actually be the steward for the game, for there to be even a hint of any official, now, this is all like in the level of like, um, this has been kind of reported, but through the documents filed in the lawsuit itself. So mm -hmm. I haven't seen like, journalism investigating whether or not this is true, right? That officials of the French Federation were threatened, right, with not actually getting the Women's World Cup if national team players um, kept maintain their participation with the suit. And there were other, I thought, I feel like in the retaliatory complaint, there were a couple um, women from the, so the Costa Rican side and maybe Mexico as well who were threatened with not being uh, fielded if they, if they played. And so um, what happened was that the, they actually added more players to the complaint, like more players at the international level stepped forward um, um, as a result of the, the stories of those threats. And they amended the complaint to try to put like a cease and desist order on FIFA and, very, and national federations that they stop pressuring athletes with regards to participation in that lawsuit. You know, where, when, that hasn't made, that has not made, that's been in the newspapers, but it's like somehow, it doesn't stick. It's not really taken up as a, a big sports story. It's not a sexy story. That, well, like, that's, I disagree. This was in the, this was in the New York Times. This is in USA Today. This is a major publication. What I think was interesting about the coverage is almost all of them. I mean, I'm not saying there's any plagiarism, but yeah, it's cut paste. Like yes, yeah, all the exactly. stories. It's, same, not, so. it's not real reporting. And not yeah. only that, but the U.S. publications had a very clear cut explanation of like this is wrong. This is what's happening, these are the US players involved, and all had a very unified perspective. Whereas when I read a lot of Canadian perspectives, probably 90% of Canadian perspectives.
perspective, um, opposite end of the spectrum, obviously. Yeah. It's their country hosting the World Cup. And you to be fair, the claim as well. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So to be to be fair on the Canadian uh, reporting side, it, it was kind of the opposite of the US. They were all saying basically the same thing, but saying, you know, it was fine for X, Y, and Z reason. So there was all this coverage from very large uh, media institutions in both countries but all saying the same thing at the surface level, which kind of goes back to the point that I was trying to make earlier, is all these like large organizations are theoretically you know, taking the time to write these stories. Why are they all saying the same thing? These are respected institutions who have, a, and these are amazing writers. How is it that there's no different angle that any of them are taking, and that you know, 90% of the coverage really reads very similar? So how, how, can, how can, I guess, as fans or as reporters, or as um, people who are reporting in the media, or people who are part of institutions, how how does that change? How is it not the same surface level kind of basic um, explanation of these like issues? Because they they were in the New York Times, they were in the yeah. major publications. But the um, just to Sarah's point of cut and paste on March first, two thousand thirteen, for me was a really big deal. It was the day that the hijab ban was struck down by FIFA, and the same the, the issue was covered in major outlets pretty much all over the world in major. I mean, even the Guardian talked about it, but it was all cutting and back, pasting back to Al Jazeera's initial mm -hmm. report that came out first. And I wrote it as something that was blogged, and that's what I was contacted on. Because are you kidding me? They can only find my voice in the entire world to repeat. Not that I'm irritated that people wanted to listen to what I have to say, but the point is, really, Iraq has a team, um, uh, Egypt has a team, a lot of the players were scarves. Pakistan has a national football team. All you need to do is a Facebook search to contact. Afghanistan has a women's league now. You really can't reach out in the world all these major journalistic institutions because at the end of the day, it's not worth the time to go to try and find it. It's much easier to regurgitate the information. And let's just do something really plain. But along that has really affected the way that a lot of, like, you know, the Middle Eastern countries, Muslim majority countries, are going to approach the game now because their women can, some of the women that choose to cover can be included. This is a really big deal for the entire sport. So I feel that issue was completely overlooked. And I mean, and, and to your point, same angle over and over again. Oh, this is really great. Okay, that's it. That's all we're really going to say. No depth whatsoever. Uh, are there opportunities in the approach to 2015 then? Um, we've spoken about some of the challenges. Uh, what, what plans do you have in the approach to 2015? Well, what are my plans? <laughs> I <gotta start> <laughs> um, no, I, I hope to. I hope honestly to be in touch with people. I hope that if somebody has a great story and is there, that they contact me and or, or somebody else at Fox, and we'll try to find. You know, I know that we're running like. 80 something features throughout the whole World Cup, and some will be filmed once we're there, and a lot of stories will come up. Um, and the beauty around the women and, and what they do and what they mean in their respective countries. Um, what plans do we have? I don't know. I mean, I've put in some requests to do some research and show some things that have never really been shown before that I've always had interest in, like like the leagues around the world where they are, whatever salary is, kind of like put it in a graphic and throw it on the screen. Um, and that stuff isn't hard. It's isn't easy to find. Mm -hmm. uh, not easy to find at all. Sometimes it's not it doesn't even exist. So hopefully, just live the experience and, and find a way to, to let it let it inspire others and draw others into our sport. And hopefully, they'll stay. So I would say, just adding on to the the Fox approach to the World Cup, I am nerding out a little bit over their plans for the World Cup um, because they're pretty extensive and well publicized. And there's a lot of firsts that are happening um, with Fox's coverage. And, you know, for better or for worse, uh, they're kind of treating the Women's World Cup as their proof that they can cover soccer. And so, yeah, maybe that's not the greatest impetus, but the fact is there is going to, there is a massive investment in this tournament and how they're covering it that is going to be hugely beneficial to women's soccer in the United States, in Canada, and abroad. So, yeah. You would hope that they would do it out of the goodness of their heart, but it's a business. Why would you honestly expect that? So when there are other opportunities, whether it's with media organizations or just the stars aligning for certain motivations, when you can see that where the promotion of women's soccer aligns with someone else's motivations, use that to your advantage. That's what sponsorship is. 
That's how you create um, branding, and that's how you get more money into the game. Uh, I watched a, a great interview with um, uh, Michael Wan, the uh, commissioner of the LPGA, and he basically talked about how he brings in sponsors um, to the LPGA. He's hugely increased the amount of money that they have on the tour after the financial crisis, which really hit them quite hard. And so he just talks about, you know, this is how we integrate that, and this is how we take someone's el someone else's mission, someone else's vision, someone else's um, reason for what they do, and make it align with ours to benefit our sport, to help move us forward. So in the way that Fox is, is you know, really investing and in doing a tremendous job with this World Cup, you know, part of that is aligned with them carrying the men's uh, World Cup in the future. And so I, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that, and I think that the way that they've approached it involved a lot of past players um, has really informed their coverage in a really cool way. I think the way that they've approached features is really engaging and talks with people on like a pretty human level telling unique stories. Um, they did a feature on Christian Press um, before the all Guard Cup matches that didn't just say, you're new to the team and have super su surface level um, discussions. She talked about how she almost quit in, I think, high school because of the pressure um, and how she went to Sweden and like that helped, you know, yada, yada, yada. But the idea is, you know, I think because of the talent they have behind what they're doing, it's informing um, a very deep um, hold on the topic rather than just kind of doing it in a very surface level way. And they have motivation to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that motivation. And in the way that we can get media to cover teams, in the way that we can get sponsors to invest in league, recognize what their motivations are and see how you can align with that. And that benefits both parties moving forward because ultimately any sort of partnership needs to benefit both people. So yeah, there's an ideal world and you hope that there's support, but realistically, how in the real world are you going to engage that, I think is really important. So. I mean, I'm going to tell a story about, like, I had a, a very weird thing happen, like, at the last Women's World Cup, um, which is, I was in Europe, but I, I wasn't planning on attending any of the matches. And um, it was partly because I wasn't, it wasn't that easy to get to the matches and whatever, you know. And also, like, it's, it's like, there's, um, there's a heat there. It's it's easier to like like say for example with the men's world cup in Brazil. I knew I wanted to write about it, but I was like, do I need to go to Brazil in order to write about it? No, it's a huge expense, and um, and also like expenditure of energy to try to actually get to matches and all that. Um, and um, I learned a little bit about that difficulty probably because it's like I have a, I had a friend who's a um, connected to the national team and somebody I've been talking to around my blog. She's sort of like a contact for me when I want to fact check something. And um, she just she just wrote me and asked if I was planning to go, and I said no, and and I was just like I, the, it's just prohibitive. And then by the time I thought maybe I should, and then I just couldn't get tickets, and I was like, I, you know, um, you know, but I'll watch. And um, I was in France at the time too, which is a fun place. It's a fun place to watch football in general. And um, she was like, you have to go. And she actually got me. I had to I had to pay for them, but she got me access to tickets to the um, the match against France. I mean, yeah, uh, the match against. France, right? So I had to root for the U.S. to beat Brazil, um, which they did, and that, which was in a pretty incredible match. And then got to go see USA, um, France, and then because U.S. won that, I got to go. To, I went to the final two, and I was also like traveling with the. I was on the family bus for the teams, so uh, for the team's families, right? So and there's several of them. So I was with um, Lori Lindsay's extended family, um, which was pretty awesome. And that was an incredible, like, I learned a lot by doing that, right? Because she knew I kind of wanted to, I wanted, I wanted to go there as a writer and as somebody who was interested in the sport, but I wasn't there in any kind of official, I didn't have a press pass, right? Um, and that actually put limits on what I was willing to actually write about, right? Because I was like, there with family, like, what a, you know, I, I don't, I would want to suggest that there's like juicy gossip I picked up or something like that, but, um, and it wasn't that, but it just felt like there was a kind of, there was a whole set of ethics that I was encountering for the first time as someone writing about the sport, um, at, at that level especially, you know, and um, I'm, I found that really humbling, like, to go to the, it's hard to ask players questions sort of thing, like, you know, you have that direct contact with the team and, and the like, and you're trying to figure out, like, how do you support that as a writer, but then for me also, it's like, how do I produce, how do I cultivate my own writing project, which is actually independent from something like the commercial enterprise of promoting the sport. I, those two things are not the same. So, you know, it was, I found myself humbled by the kind of complexity of that intimacy with the team 
And um, but then there's a material challenge of you know you you travel right to the t to the match. You're in the stadium watching the match live. Trying to follow a match and write about it at the same time is really hard. If you've ever just tried to blog a match and, and actually watch it, I can't actually write about a match if I've tweeted it um, because you miss so much if you're if you're live tweeting a match. It's really hard. Uh, it's really hard, I think, to to do that. And then, like you know, afterwards, I had to like because I'm not in the press board, so I'm not like actually in a material like a material environment that supports like. Okay, now I'm going to write like immediately on the end of the match and produce a match report on the end. It was like. You know, I had to find an outlet. You know, like I had to go, like, um, um, uh, get myself to a place where I could, like, actually do that. And it was really, like, it's a lot harder than sitting at home and watching the match on television. You can watch, you can write a decent match report without going to the country. It's one of the reasons why I've been like, I, I, I don't need to go to the Women's World Cup in person in order to support my writing practice and my engagement with football is more important to me in relation to my writing than it is as a fan in a way. Like. You know, like that's that my relationship to the sport is as a writer now, and not not just as a fan. Those two things are not quite the same. And it gave me respect for a newfound respect for the particular chat, like, the particular shape of like sports writing. You know, and so like the core of guys mostly, but not only, right? Who travel to NFL matches to uh, bas I mean, basketball? What a season to have to try and follow as a writer. The amount of writing you have to do, um, baseball, like. Like going and watching things live, and then on the spot producing a, a report that people are going to want to read, uh, but they're only going to want to read it for about 36 hours, and then they're never going to read it again. You know, and so, and the, uh, like to why write? I really love writing like that because that writing feels really alive. You know, it's kind of ephemeral, but it's there's a vitality to sports writing that is um, very particular to the inventness of the sporting event, um, and. I think one of the things that compels, like, because I, I did not start off writing about women's football. I started off writing about the men's game. Um, and I moved more and more towards the women's game, probably because I think the first time I really felt this was the, the Olympics. I was watching women's matches in the Olympics, and I couldn't find match reports on Nigeria right, um, or Brazil. Right, so if they weren't playing the United States, there were, like, the, there were no U.S.-based media outlets that would even give you a match report. You know, and I'm like, some of these teams are like amazing to watch. Or like Nadine Anger's streak in the World Cup, right? Um, like the moment of that being broken, you know, like for someone to understand what that meant, right? To have somebody score against her in the World Cup, you needed to have a lot of story before that about what that record is about, how Germany plays, like how demoralizing it must be to like go in, get, you know, game, match after match against this goalkeeper, right? Um, and then, like the event of it being of that streak being broken, and then how it was broken, like the, all of that is really, really amazing to write, you know. But that match didn't involve the United States, you know. So you, you know, if 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 not someone like us, then who is that going to be? Right. Well, that's another point about the different kinds of media coverage, and we're talking predominantly about um, English media coverage. Whereas Monica, you can delve into a little bit about Spanish media coverage. It'll be interesting at this World Cup to see what kind of coverage comes out of different countries. Like already, there was a feature, I don't know if anyone thought about using this, and this was a bit two years ago, about how yeah. focusing on how she's like a female Zizou, which is like amazing and probably the highest form of compliment that can be given to a player in France. And um, it'll be interesting to see how different countries uh, write about those, um, write about their players and, and their women and stuff like this. And in Germany, if you look um, in German media, there is times about her, but that's not accessible. I mean, maybe Google Translate now you have that option, but there is tons about her in Germany, but not that people necessarily have tuned into here. Because there's one uh, football mag from Germany, and they follow her very closely, and they follow her. And, and I remember I was sort of fangirling over um, um, Celia Sausage, yeah. and there's a new, but I don't read German, so and a lot of stuff is lost in translation. So, um, you know, but there, there are ways to go about it, but like trying to tell those broader stories here, because it's in, 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 you know, in Canada, and I mean, it's also to see how media here addresses other team stories will be really interesting to me. To see, I mean, in Canada, it's a little bit of a different thing because our women's team is much more, it has a much better record than the men. So we're more focused on women's soccer anyway. Anyone who writes about soccer in Canada is probably about the women's team. So, but to see how they write about other women's teams will be really interesting. 
like, will American uh, mainstream media write about the Nigerian team? Will they write about, you know, other teams? Like, we'll see what comes out of it. We'll probably be blogging about it, but beyond the blogs. Will there be, you know, probably, but will there be those other stories? Or we'll just have to on the it's all it's all if you want. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> Just, just before we put it all on, Monica, um, <laughs> uh, open it up to questions, Josh. There, well, there are a couple questions that have come in um, from Twitter, which actually tie in very much into that. Uh, so this is from Soul Soccer Club. Um, does the narrow image of women's sports casters, like the type that women's sports casters are supposed to fit, let's say, um, limit women's sports writers to blogs? Right. So is there sort of an is there an image that women sportscasters are supposed to have, and if so, does that sort of limit sports writers and sports casting to blog writers? Question from, from there. I'll kind of have a short answer a little bit. In my experience, I would say in soccer, there is no at all, because it's new. There's a, there's a whole bunch of, especially now, you guys are see a lot of new faces. Um, it, I encourage young girls to think about it as a career. I never thought about it. And I know that in the future, there's going to be more and more um, games on television and radio and podcasts. Start studying it because it's an art. It's hard. You know, they throw us as athletes kind of into it. And you, you have to just sort of learn as you go. Being a desk versus being a silent reporter versus being a color commentator are completely different things. Um, and I would say the most important thing is, is personality and doing your homework. Um, I don't. I don't think that I was hired because of the way I look. I don't feel that way. Some people may may say that. I don't think ESPN um, is like that at all. So I would say that this is this is a great opportunity. There's it's a market that's growing, and and you know young people and even players that are out there right now that want to start speaking in front of cameras and doing uh, public speaking when they can and and going to as many shows as they can and think about getting into it, because it's, it's awesome, it's fun. I mean, I can't think of a better job, to be honest. That's a great answer. I was going to be more cynical, but I'll just... I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that blog, like writing and blogging is very different from on-camera work. Yeah. Yeah. And people have very different personalities on the page than they do in front of the camera, and these things don't line up at all. Um, and uh, so, it, you know, I, I, you can't draw a line from one to the other. Um, I would give my right arm to take a course on match calling because I, 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 I love, love listening to good match calling. It's such an art. And, um, and people have no problem being critical there. Right. <laughs> Commentators. Yeah. Well, you, I think years ago I, on Twitter, and I've always dreamed of this, I watched this idea of like pirate match broadcasting, where we do, we just have a live stream. Yeah. You could mute the television and just have, you know, yeah. you commenting. Yeah. That does exist. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there. Well, there's a um, someone uh, in Texas. Uh, they follow the Dash quite a bit. Um, Super um, for uh -huh. anybody watching. Um, so she um, does color commentary for the Dash for their home broadcast. Oh, awesome. mm -hmm. um, but well, no, 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 she's part of the official Dash yeah. broadcast. But for U.S. national team games, for uh, she was in Trinidad and Tobago for their mm -hmm. qualifier okay. as they tried to get into the World yeah, Cup. Yeah, the one that all the money. She's the one that raised all the money. Yeah. Well, so yeah, so she so, uh, the first time she did it was in Trinidad and Tobago when all we, uh, at least what I had was like this like tiny little pirated, right, right, I can't yeah, exactly pirate stream. anything stream, um, stream. <laughs> uh, uh, of the match, and so I couldn't I couldn't see anything, and so she had Mixler and was just like talking and giving around commentary, and she's been starting to do it a little bit more and more. So the idea of like grassroots and just being like, I don't like the commentary, so I'm going to do yeah, my own. Exactly. So that, that is out there, it. not that I'm doing it. So wait, what's the name of this person as well uh, again? Keeper. 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 Yeah, you got to follow, you know, follow the right people and ask and, and become, you know, have our communities and collaborate. That's that's yeah, yeah. But because of the internet, social media, it is far oh. as possible. Right, right, I mean, right. I thought having a blog was a really big deal. I said to a friend, and I was basically penning notes on Facebook and exhausting, you know, everybody and being befriended constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Except my mother, who reads everything. And she's like, I love you, baby. You're so great. Um, <laughs> shut up, mom. Hi, mom. Uh, so, uh, but then I was like, I'll start. And it really wasn't that arduous to that point. Do it. Like, 
it's possible to do it. And it would be really fun. Like, how many podcasts in the last year have popped up? Mm -hmm. Which is really important about women's soccer. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Um, so, like, I think this is an amazing case with all women uh, panelists today. And I think, uh, but the question is, beyond just wanting kind of a diversity of voices, which is important, and it's not to diminish that, what do you, what do you think women bring um, to writing about the women's game? I mean, are there things, like, like I read on, because of Jean especially, you know, someone like Lynn Truce, and there is something different about the way she writes about women's bodies, women's stories, men's bodies, and men's stories, right? Yeah. It's not just, so I'm just asking you a little bit about, like, beyond, and, and this is, again, to diminish the importance of just of including women's voices. How are those voices changing? The I think women are funnier. I think <laughs> women are more likely, like, because I'm going to give you an you know, anecdote, like, because um, I always complain to uh, the folks behind the really great website and book series, Free Darko. So it's a, it was a, a basketball bl uh, website. Um, and um, the, it, the title is like off of Dark, this guy Darkovich was always on the bench. And so it's like playing my guess. I mean, if we're joking. First round draft pick of the so, but It's a really fantastic, really, I love the writing. I love their writing. They write about style and questions of style and basketball. And then they have two books, which are totally worth reading um, and um, that are about, they're both about just style and basketball, graphic sensibilities and style of play. Um, and um, and I was like, why don't you really, why, why only men, you know, like why, and then they basically wrote me back and they said that when they wrote about women, the WNBA yelled at them. And then I was like, but when you write about men, you care what the NBA thinks, you know? The expectation was that they get a pat on the back from the league, yeah. right, just for writing yeah. about, you know, like that, and so, and I'm like, if you don't have an antagonistic relationship to the league, you're not doing, your, you're not doing anything, right? And then, so, of course, they're not writing about women's basketball, right, so they just sort of tried that out and they didn't like it, but it, it taught me something which was like that, you know, not to be too gender essentialist about it, but that there's a carefulness around the women's sports that um, writers who don't, like, own, you know, like, who maybe, don't spend, I don't, maybe a gender thing, it might also be like where they're, the bulk of their experiences is not in women's sports. Mm -hmm. That they're afraid of saying the wrong thing, of being not supportive, you know, that there are certain kinds of pressures that I think that um, people who are more directly engaged with the world of women's sports, right, who may or may not be women, but are much more likely to be, I think, um, and um, sort of like, for example, former athletes, um, and um, you know, that you have an under, a stronger understanding of like what the difference is between, say, for example, being sexist and being critical, right? Um, and you just have a better, and I, I do think if you've been on the receiving end of sexism and on the receiving end of non-sexist criticism as a female, you're better to actually like yourself kind of, you know, modeling that, you know? So I think it can be funnier, it can be actually harder. Um, and, um, and then a lot of like, also certainly because so many of the sports writers that I know, whose writing I read that's, about women's sports and it's written by women is not in a commercial space at all. They don't have any pressure on them in relationship to their relationship to a team. Like if they say X, Y, or Z, then they're going to lose access to the team. And I'm like, those kinds of things around women's sports are really different. I'm partly because like teams, you know, you can, women's sports, barring a few, like say tennis or something like that, you're you have so much, so much more access to players and to team officials than you would ever in other contexts. Anyway, I'm spinning out a little bit. Just, just on that topic, for me, it's not, it's, as you said, the important inclusion and diversity of voices. Not in inclusion in that sense of what we have to make sure you want to. For me, it's about the quality of the stories that come out. And some of the most, like, horrible, one of the most frustrating stories I read about when the upcoming Women's Cup that actually did an open letter to the, to the, the journalist was written by a woman for the Vancouver Sun. And it was this really interesting story, and I wanted to make sure I mentioned that here because it's really important to me. It was a really great piece that someone had sent to me, and it was, a, for the majority of the piece anyway, and it, it was talking about the importance of women's soccer in, in Canada and how this was going to uplift and bring attention to financial inequalities in the sport and the funding, because although the women's Canadian soccer team performs outperforms the men, the men are paid more, and they wouldn't even release 
the figures of their salaries, and the woman had to like the woman had to press for that. So it's this wonderful story about, and I'm nodding the whole way through, like you know this is great. In the last story, the last piece, um, the last sentence I'm going to read to you because um, I was quite vexed. We might set an example for those parts of the world where girls can't play and women, women are hobbled, hobbled in burqas. That's the last sentence of this story. So I'm with this piece 99%. And then I just stopped and said, well, wait a second. No. Uh, no. Just And I wrote to the editor of the Vancouver Sun, I wrote to the author, and I'm like, listen, for you to present this story that is potentially really important, and then to be completely demeaning, particularly right around the time there's all this politics surrounding women's clothing in football, was unnecessary, particularly given all the stories of women globally who are fighting whatever issues to try to change that, and regardless of their clothing and their clothing choices or what's you know, forced upon them. I just found it extremely reductive. And so I'm not going to applaud this journalist for simply writing about it. It's the way she told the story. That was horrible. And so it's not just who, what gender is the person who's writing. What are they putting out there? Like some of the most reductive stuff that I've seen is written by, I mean, not along sports lines, is sometimes done by, you know, stuff that like has racist undertones, Islamophobic, homophobic undertones, is written by women. So I'm not just saying I want half of this to be written by women. It's the quality of what's being said. And in a lot of spaces, blog spaces or other non-mainstream um, spaces, the writing is fantastic by people who, to Jennifer's point, don't have any allegiance or have to tell a party line. No one's going to take away my press pass because I don't have one. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, you talked a little bit before about Fox, Fox News coverage having like a lot of firsts in terms of the Women's World Cup. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that and what they'll be doing that was different than coverage in years. Uh, yeah, so I can't remember if this is a first, but it hasn't happened in a while. Um, the games are going to be on broadcast television um, in this time zone. Uh, so that's massive. The millions of people that they're able to reach in prime time is huge. When you have tournaments in Germany or um, in places where the time zones make a difference, that totally changes how many viewers can turn in, tune in. And so not only does that show that people are interested, uh, but it also shows uh, commercial viability to women's soccer, right? Because if you can say objectively, you know, this many people are tuning in to watch women's soccer, then for you know the National Women's uh, Soccer League and for other uh, women's soccer organizations in the U.S., it makes sponsorship conversations go a lot better. Um, another example is, um, I can't remember the exact breakdown, but um, I know that the number of female analysts and in-studio hosts um, who are women and who are former players, um, I think it's the highest that it's ever been um, in comparison. Not necessarily that ESPN wasn't doing a good job before, I just think it shows the overall evolution of how the Women's World Cup is covered. And so Fox is almost a continuation of what ESPN started, because ESPN obviously still did a good job as well. And you know, if they had it this year, I'm sure they would have continued that progress. Um, they're, I think, uh, I believe they're also the first uh, broadcast. Uh, so you're gonna have to hold me accountable if any of you're wrong. Um, they have, a, they're gonna, they have a broadcast set up in Vancouver. They have, they have a, a studio yeah. that they are building. I have a Vancouver. picture of it on my phone. Yeah. So <laughs> it's you know, cool. all, all of these. All all these resources to really deliver women's soccer in the, the way that consumers are used to consuming their right. sports. All of these crazy camera angles, all of these stats, all of this slow-mo. Um, it's hard, I mean, speaking, coming from um, the sphere, it's, it's hard to compete with that. Like, we have, I would say, pretty good streams. They're available internationally. They're non-geo-blocked. Every single game is broadcast. That's better than any other women's soccer league in the world. But... When you're comparing that to like Fox's broadcast of NFL games, it, the production value just it can't be the same, and it's hard for people to be like, "Oh yeah, I shouldn't watch watch women's soccer; it's like super boring." It's like, yeah, you're watching two camera angles on a normal field. Yeah, we don't have like an in-game eagle cam. <laughs> yes, I get it. That is no not as exciting as that. <laughs> so the idea of having that production value with the women's game to get people in, because of course. The World Cup is going to galvanize people, and then people will go back to maybe not caring on a daily basis. about. And that's true of just soccer. That's how the Men's World Cup works, too. 
but if you can keep some percentage of that that weren't there before, like that's a net gain, right? So I'm really excited to see what happens with their coverage because I think it, I think the the thoughtful, um, high quality way that they're doing it gives the opportunity to have it not just be like the bungee experience, right? Come mm -hmm. in for the World Cup, come right back out. If you learn these stories about these women, if you learn about these leagues, if you see, um, you know, not just the surface level, the surface level information, maybe you become a fan um, of not just the World Cup, you, you follow it afterward. And so I think having really good coverage that's very engaging and isn't just checking boxes is really important to that. And I think a lot of their first help um, shape that and just a lot of the investment that they're putting into will hopefully result in that. I could just channel Grant Wall for a moment because when Grant was here on yeah. Tuesday, he made a lot of, some of the, you know, similar points. Yeah. About and, and he was suggesting it's really quite different, even from 2011, where yeah. people kind of caught up with the story. Like it became an interesting tournament, and they sort of rushed journalists to Germany, and people like a lot of there were. I think he said just a few at the most of the tournament, and then a bunch of people came in at the end. Whereas this is a yeah. whole deployment from the beginning, but also that Fox has, he said, um, taken on sort of the stars like Abby Wambach and, and you know the others on the team. And basically, he was sort of saying like they're it's like they're stars in a Fox um, uh, reality show at this point. Like they're but they're flying them, to, which he was saying in a good way. Like he's like they're they flown them to the Indy 500. They flown them to events. Yeah, they're, they're cross promotion. They're, they're putting them on screen constantly in other Fox things. In other words, they've basically taken on you know the responsibility for a kind of media generation around these personalities mm -hmm. with their whole might, you know, as a, as a, as a media corporation. Which is a way to which is interesting to other journalists, yeah. not just mm -hmm. other sports audience, but other So it does seem like there's a kind of... Almost for the World Cup on Hockey Night in Canada, which is huge, because right. it's a completely different, different demographic yeah. of viewers. And I don't know, maybe we could talk about like the Fox promo ads and stuff, but which are kind of fascinating, yeah. you know, that they put up. But there is a sort of whole, like, the inter there is, it seems to be somewhat of a first that a major media corporation is maybe all in is too much to say, but they're they're clearly they see a collusion between promoting this World Cup and their own you know agenda. Yeah, totally right. That there's not. A, but. I will say this, and this is, I'm saying another happy thing, so you guys will like it. But yeah. I don't know. We've been happy for like ten minutes. Yeah, okay. so I'm <laughs> and I think it's a beautiful thing. The the Fox producers went down to Brazil, and the ESPN producers come on in, look at everything. Here's what we're doing, and I think that collaboration is. Mm -hmm. That was really cool that ESPN did that, that they're in touch. Um, you know, I came on literally about two weeks before the World Cup started. So the whole process and leading up, I mean, I literally was just thrown into it. I had been playing before that. And what I remember was that at that time, it was unprecedented to have every single game on television. And that's what ESPN did, and that's the bar they set. So what, you know, how Fox is going to up that, well, I mean, we are in a time now, four years later, with a lot more social media and mm -hmm. interaction through, through the, you know, through the internet and set and all of that. What, what I was told, um, you know, in our meetings when I went with Fox, and I'm just fortunate that I get to work for both, you know, for both companies, and I'm getting to see sort of a different perspective, um, is that they're not, they're not taking this as a dress rehearsal. They're, they're doing, they're going, they're doing everything exactly the way they're going to do uh, for the men and trying to give it absolute everything they can. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm excited, you know, it's every game again on TV, but lots, a lot of hours, mm -hmm. um, a lot more people, a bigger cast, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a question I'll pose to anybody, especially I guess the people on Twitter and, here, and, and you guys here on the panel is, you know, Sarah, you mentioned after the World Cup. And in '99, here in the states, we drew up and we benefited from that and started a league. And then we, you know, and then we messed it up. Um, maybe, maybe this time, let's have more collaboration before. Because who's responsible for carrying it over? Who's responsible for taking what we do in the World Cup and making it carry on and making those fans, you know, now become NWSL fans? Is it is it all is it all on NWSLs and all is it all on, <laughs> on the players? Is it on the media, or can we all collaborate and do our part? You know, and that starts during the World Cup. Um, we have to, as as a network from the United States, we have to do our part to make sure and link the stories to the World Cup to the NWSL. It's also very convenient that the World Cup is not terribly far. I mean, it's in Canada, so it's accessible. Our dollars doing terribly, so that's. Certainly, <laughs> but 
mean, but okay. not, not, <coughs> not as bad as the peso. But um, so in that sense, this is almost like it's like a blessing that it is so close. And there's tons of people traveling to these these places from different parts. Like I mean, and and, and places and, and cultures of soccer where it's not as I mean, people don't know this, but in Moncton, New Brunswick, there's a lot of huge soccer culture there. I'm from the East Coast of Canada. There's a tremendous soccer culture in the East Coast of Canada. And the people, might, uh, women's soccer specifically, and people don't might not know this. So the fact that it's hitting different places, even across Canada, is really important. There was some discussion, how come it's not in Toronto? But I, personally, I think it's a great thing that Moncton is hosting. That, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily think Moncton hosts soccer, but it's there. Women's soccer is there. I mean, one of the things to go to return to the, the day in day out of the league stuff because it's not unrelated, right? It's like you know, there's a stick, there's a there's a television audience, right? And broadcast like you know the broadcast culture of the game, but then there's also like you know for the league. My understanding is that you need people in the stands. Mm -hmm. That is good. Yeah. Yeah. Like that is like <laughs> you, know, you know that that's that's you know that's where that's where support needs to convert into. Yeah. People going to matches in person, partly because you don't have actually the same kind of way of. It's just like uh, you know, because I mean, you don't have the same commercial value around the broadcast of the match that can convert into supporting this team. You know, so um, it has to begin with um, people in the stands. And, um, and so I have a kind of a general question because I'm speaking like as somebody who lives in Los Angeles, and um, um, you know, like I can't get to women's matches that don't, without traveling quite a distance in a car. Um, and if I made it past transit, that'd be about a two-hour bus ride. Um, and um, and that's that's to see kind of semi-pro um, level. Um, and even when the um, LA Soul were playing in Carson, it was still, you know, like as a lead, the, the, so the soccer dedicated stadium in Los Angeles is um, not in the center of the city. Um, which could actually host a soccer dedicated. I've never understood why it's been located in person. Um, um, but anyway, like I was just wondering, like about if I could ask, like about stadium location um, in particular for 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 you two in terms of like your experiences with women's pro teams and the like. Like, how much do you think that impacts things? Like, um, if you have like Sky Blue playing in you know in New Brunswick, New Jersey, versus being in a stadium. Even a small stadium, but that's easier to get to. Because I've always understood that to be part of the Portland story, right? This um, the location of the stadium being very generative to like having easy access to um, watching games live in the stands, and that being actually kind of something around which the city culture might identify itself. So I think there are a lot of nuances to that, and I think every team in the league has a slightly different setup. So. You know, you do have some teams, especially in the, on, honestly, a lot of it has to do with geography, right? Like downtown city real estate and facilities in the Pacific Northwest are not like they are on the East Coast, where there you have higher population density, rents are higher, it's more expensive to deal with that, right? So you have Seattle and Portland, who are both in the center of their cities. Um, obviously, Portland has done quite well, and Seattle is really like Memorial Stadium. Um, so if you compare that with, say, Chicago and D.C., um, you know, the feasibility of having, um, I mean, even the MLS team, at least in Chicago, is in downtown. So I would say that that plays, in, plays into it as well. Um, so, you you know, we want to be sustainable, right, for a league that wants to continue into the future. So while there are a lot of pluses to being in the center of a city and connecting with millennials and um, people who are urban city dwellers, like, there's obviously a lot of positives to that. At the same time, you want to look at um, your realistic uh, game plan for how are you going to, you know, exist year to year and plan and be sustainable. And so sometimes that means, you know, having a more suburban uh, location that can fit around, you know, 5,000 people I think is a pretty good size for um, speaking about Chicago, um, just as the example, the Red Stars and then the Spirit have a similar facility. Um, and so because you're making that decision, you know, you can be there every single day. You can have your locker room facilities there. Um, the Spirit plan, one of the best grass um, services for a pro team in the entire country. And so uh, they have a strong uh, footprint in the youth soccer community, which is huge in D.C. So D.C. has some of the most stable, good-sized crowds um, in, in the league. And, you know, yes, that's not 13,000 people like in Portland, but it's three, four, five thousand 5,000 people, and that's a good number for the team. And it means that they're, you know, on a path to success and on a path to sustainability. So if you can, you can reach that, um, it makes 
there is less of an impetus to immediately say, okay, how do we go to the center of DC? Um, you know, there's a strong identity um, at Maureen Hendricks Field uh, in Maryland, and so I think it's just about assessing, okay, what's your team identity? How can you have the number of fans that you need to to be su sustainable? And then maybe in the long term, you have a different vision. Um, but for some teams, being center city is very important. That's what Seattle chose to do when they moved from Starfire, which is a little in Tubwilla. So I think it's just about recognizing the market you're in and how you're going to be successful. There is not a one-size-fits-all. Not everybody is going to be in Portland. Not everybody should be Portland because not everywhere is Portland. That's not to say that Portland doesn't do really great things and there are really great lessons to be learned. But the idea of turning every single city into a Portland is not sensical um, and it's not productive. So instead of saying, oh, let's tell the story of Portland a million times and say everyone should be like them, hey, let's let's look at the aspects of Portland in a very critical way and say what of these are can be cross-applied to these other cities. So I love hearing stories about Portland because it's an awesome success story. What I would be more interested in hearing more often is what parts of Portland can be cross-applied to these other cities. And so consistency also is one of the most important things, right? And that's achieved in different ways in different places. Absolutely. Yeah. Just to keep it as open as possible, are there any more Twitter questions? Oh, or okay. questions? Go ahead. I think I have the So I'm curious about what kind of demographics you either experience in the stands or on television or to have for the 2015 World Cup, um, if the changing demographics of the U.S., particularly with um, Fox Deportes um, coverage of soccer matches, it will change the demographics for the Women's World Cup. Um, and if who, who's the who's the target audience, and how does that change the demographics of the place? I should probably like know that kind of stuff, but. <laughs> I won't talk. I won't talk long. I just remember ES. What at ESPN last World Cup final? We had 13.5 million people watching. So let's mm -hmm. try to beat that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's already going to happen. We've had Hope Solo be on reality shows since mm -hmm. then, and Demi Larue's married to Dom Dwyer. I mean, they need a reality show now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That'll take care of all our problems. That'll take care of all our <laughs> What is the Spanish language yeah. coverage? Set up. I mean, I don't know. Is it? In the is, oh, you, yeah. No, I, I mean, in the states, how is it going to work? Who has? I don't know who has a race in the states for Spanish. Okay. 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 But is Fox? Is Fox going to do Spanish language and yeah, yeah, right. I don't know. I might, so do, I might do some stuff in Spanish and shoot it down to Mexico, Mexico for their for their oh. programs and stuff. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's just separate. Yeah. So it wouldn't be global. Yeah, no, so Fox will be, you know, for the States, just for English and the States. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, can I just ask, too, what did, so talking about the commercial, because the media, since it's a media panel, and this series of commercials that's come out from Fox, can I just get reactions from people <laughs> on that commercial? America. Um, what? Which one? America. America. Yeah, uh, I would love to get people's take on it because as soon as it came, it's a very striking, the U.S. women, I don't know if they've seen it. I, I have, I just, I, I'll be I'm going to take a show it. Can we show it? Yeah, I mean, it's only 90 seconds or something, right? It's, yeah, you mean the one, the one where the, 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 the women are the redeemers, right? Right, yeah. the, the women are, are the redeemers in America. America is. How do you pronounce it? America? No, I'm, I'm, I'm making a joke. Uh, I know, because I'm we're sarcastically yeah. referring to the hegemonic presentation of the U.S. In the, I, I would say that the presentation of that commercial is in line with how like U.S. Olympic team. It's very in line with how Team Team USA. It, I mean, I find it compelling. That's better than the team like no that. one's ever heard of. Like that was 2007 ESPN. Yeah, greatest team you've never heard of. I mean, that is. <laughs> I never got over that. So you think this is a a, a a better version of this? I mean, Jen, you're referring to that commercial and your reaction to never getting over it. Do you feel this is? A I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, which I'm like, I'm gonna play. Okay, let's just I like I like this better because the legitimacy, the respect is built in. These, this team is good. If it's not, if you okay, this is what's happening. I like taking it in. Never heard of them, but they're really good. 
I do think they learn, you know, like I do, I actually do think that, um, that, you know, when you have like the, the world of people who are like independent bloggers re responding in unison, like in protest regarding like for, um, something like that, so that people do actually eventually pay attention to that. Yeah, this is the one I think I might be in, it's not a lot. It's redemption. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll just see. Let's see if the circle. We can keep talking. The, 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 the Wi-Fi is. Because it doesn't seem like it's connected. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And they were talking about the girls. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good to know that article comes up first, though, when you like. That's actually hard to find. <laughs> 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 Okay, and maybe I can continue. 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 I was just looking for quick reactions to the out. current media okay. campaign. Yeah. So, I'm sure it's pro America. I think that's a good way to sell it. <laughs> Though it does seem to ignore maybe the changing demographics that Jen is actually talking about. If 25% of the country is going to be Spanish speaking in the next five to ten years, but they'll be tuning in on. Yeah, no, 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 no. So, okay, so here's the thing. I was thinking of the MLS broadcast, yeah. right? So MLS is broadcast on Fox, mm -hmm. ESPN, and then with Fox, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting to look at the um, the viewership, right? Because Unibas has actually been huge. Like, mm -hmm. the last time I looked, it was like 900,000 people watched from Unibas, and then I think the ESPN2 broadcast was like 200,000, right? So if... Do you, like, what do you go after, right? Because no, yeah. you try to get people, like, do you try to go after that market that really are, is already in another place? Or do you just try to accept the fact that this other channel is broadcasting in Spanish, so they're probably going to get this Spanish-speaking uh, audience and then go ahead, like, with your own promotion. So I think that's the, the place that I'm coming from, the idea of, like, promoting, like, the U.S. very heavily for Fox mm -hmm. is, if another Spanish um, language broadcaster has the rights, are you going to capture people who were going to tune into that anyway? I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's, I mean, I think there's another, there's a difference between the language in which people watch, right? And, but that's not always, because it's like, let's say, if we're talking about like the changing demographic or it's not just a demographic of the U.S., it's a demographic of people who support the U.S. national men's team. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know, like, I kind of, it's soccer is such a weird one anyway, like, because there's a kind of a, a defensiveness around uh, fans of the U.S. men's national team. Like, that, at least I experience is like a kind of overproduction of American masculinity around a, a certain kind of, like, a certain, I don't know, a certain kind of jingoism that, um, seems to even exceed normal requirements for jingoism around jingoistic international competition. Mm -hmm. And um, it is different to see that if this does like map onto women's sports. I think that I think that this very much is. Yeah. And um, and my only concern would be that actually one of the things that I found really interesting about the soccer community in the US versus let's say Argentina mm -hmm. or Brazil is it it actually tends to be less chauvinistic nationally. Than Argentina, I mean, yeah. think about right. Um, but this sort of ad campaign. Yeah, but is, I mean, like the Nike ads for the U.S. men's national team were super macho. And no, I mean the women. Yeah. I'm sorry, oh, the I, women. I meant okay, the women. Yeah. But, sorry. Yeah. but Happy you'll take. Finally managed. Okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry if I've derailed. I just find no, it no, like it's a striking. Yeah, perpetual. Battle in our no, it's the topic is media. <laughs>
It didn't help. You finally succeeded. The new fans had it all. It didn't end in the bar shut their doors. First woman. And a few weeks went dark. When the celebration stopped, and the pace washed away. <laughs> That's so it's awesome. the final chapter of this story. It's just getting started. And all that we loved, all that we believed, all that made us one giant beating heart is about to take flight. One more time. I don't care. I love it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I completely understand it's effective in drawing your emotions and yeah. being exciting. And but it's not that different from Rocky Four in the training montage, right? Rocky no, versus that's the, the Russian. Point, right? Or I mean, Rocky One Two. It's not really an embrace. Right. It's not. It's not really an embrace of a global game. Or or no, sustainable. I think all that it's trying to do, all that's trying to do is say is try and lure the fans that watch Brazil into this one. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise yeah. it would be about how the US women lost the last one yeah. in the final. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Otherwise it would be like you know, they gave you your reason to watch. You can be yeah. positive and look at all the ways it could have been done in this positive. Yeah. It's the only non American on the Panel right now, I'm like, I'm the job just because I'm not American. Duel. Yeah. I'm, I'm like no American whatsoever. But it's very, from my perspective, it's very typical. I expect a little more, you know, rah rah, sis, boom, bah. But it's very typical. Like our Canadian team promos are very like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. Forget about what happened last time. Even though we're all, all traumatized what happened last time. That's okay. Yeah, but that's but, expensive. Yeah, it, it is. is. Well, that's I think it's kind of. I mean, I showed this to my yeah. class the other day. We had a whole discussion about it. But I, I think. I mean, I think uh, for all. Of course, there's all kinds of issues with it. I thought that I do think there's something kind of fascinating about the depiction of the male team as a very abject, yeah. defeated, yeah. about to be executed. I mean, I sort of. Yeah. That's what. It is. Sort of, he's basically dying. And then he transforms into to Alex Morgan, yeah, 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 and yeah, then they become so the kind of heroic warriors. It's obviously every trope, you know, it's it's tapping into all these tropes, but in kind of an interesting way. I mean, I think you imagine like, that that commercial be happening in another country. It's, yeah. Exactly, it, it's impossible to imagine that the England women's national team yeah, could, yeah. could be depicted give as some the, kind yeah. of redemption to yeah. the squalid <laughs> failure of the male <laughs> yeah. England right. national That's team. Right. I, I would, I would yeah. love yeah. an yeah. advertisement yeah. like that for yeah. women's football in England because we'd never get it. Mm -hmm. and I like the really for yeah. women's football. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> what, we want, what we don't see is the reverse. We don't see the invocation of the US women's national team in the context of advertisements supporting the men's program. Yeah. yeah, and that will be the next step that I would like to see, right? Because it was something that made me among the many things that made me angry. Like as like, I mean, probably one of the most like consistent strains on from a left wing was uh, I would say let's call it feminist media critique of the um, of the U.S. national program's treatment of the men's and women's game when it came to advertisement. And uh, so, for example, around um, I can't remember if this which World Cup this was. I remember getting a last minute audition call forwarded to me from um, through my involvement with like local youth soccer stuff. And it was Nike looking for boys between like ages, you know, like eight and fourteen. And it was like a last minute thing where they were doing kind of a flash ad um, thanking the men's team. No girls, right? You know, so they did this ad where little boys were thanking the US men's national team for all that they gave in the tournament. No girls. And I just was like, there's no reason for that. There's no reason to exclude girl children, like girls from an ad a national advertisement campaign thanking the US team for all, you know, laying it on the field, or whatever. You know, um, it's just raw sexism, but it's also this like abject, like, or this fear that somehow they mingle the men's team with the women, right? Then you're doing something bad to the men's team. But you you bring the men in into the story of the women's team. We've done something good, you know. I definitely think it's better that we desegregate like the fan culture in general because that's actually the world, you know. <laughs> it's not just men being fans of men and women being fans of women. That's just not what it is. 
Um, but the you know the thing that we we haven't seen yet, at least in terms of the U.S. the presentation of the U.S. men's national program, is that team having any relationship to the women's program, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, so this is a step forward. Which is north of the border. It's the exact opposite situation because I mean there was a hashtag after the last World Cup, and my boys were even saying it. I'm going to play like Sinclair because we don't actually have any heroes in Canadian soccer, men's soccer to look to. So it was the women's soccer team that really made names for themselves. Like you could ask young boys, like in my my boys, my son's classmates could name half the women's school starting squad. They couldn't do it for the men's. I mean, I don't think I could do it for the men's. So I mean, for us, like an ad like this wouldn't even that even type of narrative wouldn't even exist because our men haven't even gotten. Even <laughs> so it would be completely different. Ad just it's he's basically going on their drive and their passion and their. They're wanting to win. It's we don't even we can't even do this exercise. What's interesting internationally is I was part of like a conversation on Twitter with a lot of people um, from Europe and from outside the United States, and they actually mentioned that uh, as far as like the players that they know, like because they're fond of men's and women's football, for Americans they know way more famous female soccer mm -hmm. players than male soccer players because when you're Mia Hamm, you're Abby Wambach, you're Alex Morgan. You are the best in the world at soccer. I love the U.S. men's national team. I can't say that about the the, the men on the U.S. men's national team. They, they aren't at the level of uh, Diego Costa. They aren't at the level of you know these other huge international superstars. So it's interesting how that uh, perception changes once you leave the United States mm -hmm. over just casually knowing someone's name and like level of importance. It just it just kind of taught me that everything is relative, right? Like uh, when you compare like the the superstars in the German men's national team, people are going to go know their names, but maybe not um, like Mix Diskarud. Whereas if you look at on the women's team, um, because of their like comparative status, so it's interesting how that conversation changes once you leave the United States. But it is also something I'm really looking forward to talking along the lines of media coverage. Like we saw this this year. With the Puskas, it was a woman school uh, stuff. Um, Roche was nominated for the best school of the year, and I'm wondering how many this year, with all the coverage and the camera angles, and the, how many more goals will be nominated next year? Mm -hmm. For the, it'll change. I mean, I'm very hopeful about this, and the fact that Steph Roche's goal was actually caught. We talked about this already. Was uh, yesterday was incredible, and how many goals have we missed mm -hmm. in these right. in different matches of, of the women's game? But I'm really excited to see what that. I would love to see an all women's. Can, can I ask a question on Steph Roche? So Steph Roche is playing soccer in the United States this year. Can anyone tell me the team that she plays for? I didn't even know. That can anyone in the room tell me the team that she plays for? Not no. the Dash. She plays for the Houston right, Dash. Oh, okay. Can anybody tell me if the Houston Dash have a match coming up anytime in the next? Yeah. Right yeah. now. Today. So when is it today? 8.30 p.m. on YouTube. That. That's why I know. <laughs> it is very easy to watch matches, better. but yeah. I say this not to put you on the spot, because of course I'm not using it. We need reminders, though. But the but the yeah. bosses to get I, I yeah. agree with just the idea this. of people, so it, it goes to the idea of of, one, of, of sparks, right? Of, of moments of galvanizing support and awareness. So we all saw her goal with the Puskas, with the FIFA award. Everyone knows about Stephanie Roche. Okay, so that support, that awareness, where did that all go? So how can we make people aware and how do we get excitement for Stephanie Roche coming to the U.S.? How do we get excitement and everyone who knows Stephanie Roche's name to know that she plays for the Houston Dash? How do we translate that to the people that are living in Houston? And obviously I have a very myopic view in that I really care about people coming um, to you know, lead games in the U.S. But it's, it's the idea of, okay, this World Cup is huge and these amazing things are going to happen and it's going to be tremendously exciting and fabulous. Okay, so everybody who tuned in and learned uh, names of different players who, you know, they come to the U.S. and play in the National Women's Soccer League next year or they sign after the conclusion of the World Cup. Okay, how do I in D.C. or these other teams bring people in who tuned in uh, to the TV to watch these watch these games, how do I bring you to the stadium? How do I make you aware of my team? Uh, like we have a Nigerian on our team, Francisca Ortega, Nigeria. It could be a really exciting team to watch. They're going to be in the U.S.'s group. 
you know, how do we make that happen? And I think it's really interesting to talk about the awareness and the articles and you know these big events that are happening. But ultimately, you know, those soccer players to get where they are, like have to play in a league, they have to have support, they have to have things on a day to day basis. Because a lot goes into that amazing goal that Stephanie Pusca scored. A lot goes into that, and that's kind of the day to day boring stuff, right? That uh, I'm I'm really interested in. So I don't know if anybody has any ideas about that, but that's at least for us is something that we struggle with every day. How do all those millions of people who are going to tune in into the U.S. How do I make them care about my team? How do I get them in the media door? care about yeah. about reporting on the local teams? Yeah. If that doesn't happen, in the room. So there's going to be this huge groundswell, right, because of Fox coverage, because of the Women's World Cup, and then when does the women's season start? It's going to start nine months later, you know, nine months later, um, right? So how are you? No, we'll, like, still, the we'll still have all of July okay. uh, and August in front of the network. So we'll still have two full months. And will the players be coming back? To yes. Season? Right, like right over. Currently contracted ones, yes. And then hopefully there will be some signings after the conclusion of the World Cup. Yeah. So I think the audience is watching Spirit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we look at the evolution of tinnitus, it takes time, but we'll get there once we actually start to perfect the actual game itself, because it is a product. And commit, people want to see an almost polished product. That's why we like tinnitus, because they're almost perfect in golf, because we expect it here. I, I have like a coercive beliefs attitude about it, you know, which is like, as you know, like they, when those, the broadcast rights are bundled, you know, and um, and I, I'm curious to know like what on the FIFA side, it's like they must require, other, otherwise why bundle them? They must require some kind of see-through on that, right? And um, uh, I'm cynical enough to think that, for example, no major sports network would actually bother with the Women's World Cup otherwise. Because like basically, as well, for so many tournaments, it's a surprise that anyone cared, right? So like, why were they broadcasting them at all if they didn't think there would be an audience, right? So, um, and so I just, you know, kind of have that, that kind of a question like kind of a larger question to people who know more about this 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 kind of thing, like about how, you know, like I've always wondered why are so many NCAA women's foot soccer tournaments, I mean matches, ordinary matches, on cable television? Does the NCAA bundle broadcast rights for you know so that when you are um, buying the rights to broadcast uh, March Madness, are you also committing to broadcasting? Other things, other things that are bundled into that, and um, it's one of the problems with regards to the media support for women's professional soccer in the United States is that it's not actually bundled into something that anyone really cares about, um, and, and that so far as you kind of have to actually strong arm these organizations. You know, I mean, like, in, there is like, you know, this thing called public television. There are other countries that um, that uh, regulate um, access to um, um, broadcasts regarding like what's, say, for example, of public interest. That's how England with English women's football ends up on like match of the day, right? It's out of a sense of this is in the, in the public's interest, right? And that's not a commercial interest, but rather something more like a cultural commons, you know? And um, this is kind of what we're advocating for in relationship to talking about women's football is, for example, important for the greater good and having all of these social benefits and broadcasting it is actually supporting that. Um, but there's a gap between that argument and then the, um, the logics that are used by commercial sports media, right, which is about pro a product and an ec economic benefit. You can't actually put those things together at once. It has to be a shotgun marriage. I wanted just to, <laughs> so, to reiterate so what the, mixed metaphor there, so. the idealist yeah. of using sport as a vehicle. But yeah, I think it's hugely important, particularly in places like globally where you can literally work with, and if you're using football as a vehicle to to empower girls or to work at some sort of program. A lot of relief agencies actually use football because it can completely unify 22 people with the least amount of expensive equipment. Mm -hmm. It's practical to be able to do this. And Monica keeps using a word that I love, it's collaboration. And we talk, we're talking about media here, but the media doesn't necessarily have to be, like, I mean, it's important to talk about the World Cup and how it's being broadcast, but every blogger, it can, their voice counts. I mean, I mean, I feel that way. Every, like, Twitter, you were asking about ideas about how to expand this. I found a, a Women's Soccer United on Twitter, and they do an incredible job of live tweeting matches in Europe that I cannot find. I couldn't find a live stream in Canada for the NCAA did one game. So, I mean, and I mean, I'm not terribly right, people. Well, I, I asked for one, <laughs> I mean, yes, I do. And, but my point is, is that <clears throat> there's places out there, and they don't have a tremendous amount of huge followers, but there are people out there doing this work, and they're, they're live tweeting uh, local games and then like, you know, women's Champions league games and then games in Scandinavian and Sweden, league games. And this is, this is important stuff. And it's a matter of having a place where we can all connect and reach out to another because the way to grow this, because the player and I agree that maybe, you know, big media outlets following the example and doing their own thing about broadcasting the Women's World Cup, but it's a very different flavor than the men's. And it needs to be, I don't think you can handle and follow every single same step that you would necessarily. I mean, I, I'll defer to you on that and how maybe major media outlets handle it. But from what I see, those small voices, there's huge voices all over the world. I found a gen blog randomly by just sort of Googling it and I'm like, oh my God, this woman's amazing and brilliant. <laughs> and just sort of like, okay. And then you find others like, you know, who I think are hugely, huge contributors to advancing the women. And you find these people, their voices may not be, you know, huge voices in the spectrum, but they're super important. And my point is just to sort of reiterate what she was saying is collaborations and sharing information and not competing for space because there's tons of space for everybody out there.
connected. So that's my feel good. Yay. Yeah, and I think the importance is just to be authentic because we we we're smarter now than we used to be, and we can kind of people can sense it when you're not authentic. And what I've learned about sports casting too is that everybody has their own opinion and everybody's different, and and um, everyone brings something unique. So if you're not at least not yourself, if you want to you know if you want to write write what you really think and why you know and it's okay. And don't try to be like this person or try to be do a blog like that person. Take whatever your best assets are and whatever you feel like your passion is and go for it. And that's that's what's gonna come out and I think that's what draws people draws people in. Yeah. Um, I just I have a couple like thought I should speak as a blogger for a little bit. Just you know, like um, I totally I think what what you just said was really wrong true and it's kind of important I think also with like thinking about like the broadcast of women's matches in particular and that's one thing that's actually that I think has changed a lot over time like the past like say 10 to 12 years you know is that they go back to that kind of carefulness around women's sports it's a turnoff for the viewer you know um, what, what are you talking about like carefulness well just like that I don't you know like that um, everything has to be positive you know the um, um, you know that to, to, to look back over the time of like the arc of following say, the U.S. women's national team and like that there seemed to be such a limited range of stories that could be told in a way and um, um, I don't know I just think that there's that there seems to be more of that uh, authenticity or particularity to the ways in which people are talking about the women's game now which feels really good so, but that said like on my blog the most traffic I've ever gotten was for um, a post that was nothing but it was at two pictures one was of Hope Solo and one was of Marta. And um, it was just in advance of a USA Brazil matchup. And I don't even remember that it had a sexy title, but Hope Solo was in the, the title of the article, right? Um, and um, um, that was by far the most popular post on From a Left Wing. Um, and anytime, anytime I've done anything about Hope Solo, there's been significantly more traffic on my because website. she was on a reality show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What yeah. a lot of people want to do a reality show. I mean, if wants to do a reality show, you could do a reality show about salads. I mean, they do. Whatever. Yeah. You, make fun. you just don't make it about like that or that person. Pick, yeah. pick another topic and then just have them. But, you know, like, just being like social media is a weird thing, you know, and it's like the, what, what generates interest and traffic isn't always actually good for the sport or, or good for your blog. Right. But if the yeah. product is good, however you draw them in, they're going to stay because mm -hmm. the product is good so I feel confident in the product that we have right now I know it's going to continue to evolve but that's one thing that's one area where it's billions it speaks people. to what your readership does like the most popular photo that I've blogged about women's soccer is a couple of women uh, on a beach in Gaza Palestine playing soccer in long black robes mm -hmm. and so it depends what your readership is because yeah. that definitely wasn't a, a sexualized image at all but people like seeing that and there's an aspect of football that makes people feel good. It well, and the girls on the team right now are cool as shit. I mean, they yeah. have awesome personalities, you know, and I think the viewers want to get to know them more. So whatever way that can happen, I think if people will watch, and then people will become even more invested. What about a reality show about us? That's yeah. a great idea. <laughs> that's what we've got. Yeah, but that's what's going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to know what you do. I am watching that for the Golden Girls. It's really not that amazing. <laughs> I mean, I do think, and it's something, maybe we can talk about this more collectively later, but we, some of us have already talked about, you know, would there be a way to do some sort of platform during the Women's World Cup that allows for this whole spectrum of, I think one of the things to keep alive, right, is that the, the, the writing around women's soccer has, you know, all these potential implications and, and places to go, and in some ways can be more interesting. In some oh, ways, it'll start with the girls. Right. They're the best salespeople. Mm -hmm. And that was told to me when I was a player by Joe Cummings my first week as a professional athlete. He sat us all down and said, none of us knocks are going to sell this team like you do. And he gave us all a stack of women's cards, I mean, uh, schedule cards, and drew on the tee, talked to people, don't be shy, go to a restaurant, ask if you can put the cards down. I mean, like, you know, Girl Scout type stuff, and getting the word out. But that's what it took. And we did it very humbly and, and went to clinics and did all that. Well, the girls now are like, you know, little experts on social media and doing cool things. And I was talking to some girls on the Mexican national team the other day. I hung out with them on Easter, and they made a cool little video dancing and something new cool. And I'm like, you guys need to keep doing that because they're all mad. They went into a sporting store in Mexico City, 
and there was a huge banner of Alex Morgan. So I took a picture of my phone, and I have the picture on my phone, and I'm thinking, well, in a way, it's kind of cool that, you know, it's I, it's true, probably one of the most famous soccer players in Mexico besides Maribel Dominguez after her is Alex Morgan. Um, and that's a good thing, and it's a bad thing, because, you know, why can't they have a Mexican player, you know, in the stores in Mexico? There's no Alex Morgan in Canada. I can tell you that, but, <laughs> but just when you're talking about um, uh, social media, some of my daughter and her soccer team, I'm like, oh, do you read the blogs? Do you watch the ads? She's like, no, we follow all the Kane soccer team on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So right. oh, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. that's how they connect with them. And she's like, oh, Karina LeBlanc posted this amazing picture. Mom, like, did you see it? I'm like, no, but I do now. Like, I follow them now. But it's changing. Like, I might read the blogs or read it, but younger girls in the next generation have different ways and they're tapping into that and they're accessing people that way which is fantastic and that'll draw people you know that'll draw people in and it keeps them connected uh, how much time do we have <laughs> Sorry, while, while we're still on that topic i just wanted to bring up the idea of digital ambassadors in the fawsl because i think Wow, the idea of like a cool Easter photo or like Karina LeBlanc like doing her hair in like some awesome way or like sharing a trip that she went on. I think that's all great, but I think um, some in, in addition to that or on top of that, in no way criticizing that at all, um, having you know some players who are inclined to be more active and who have an interest in social media doing it in a little bit more um, conscientious way to be digital ambassadors the way that um, CEO Chamberlain is the one who I am um, most familiar with, but who are connecting the thing that they do and the places that they want fans to go and how they can support them in, in, their, in their profession, which is soccer, um, I think is really important. So the fact that you know people know the club that she plays for, the league that she plays in, um, the events that she's going to, in addition to all the fun aspects of social media, I think that's a really important element because you know that's the idea of you have you have this catalyst, you have all these followers, you have all all of this power, honestly, to raise awareness about whatever you want. And yeah, that could be you know um, a funny like lip sync video that you make or like a commentary on some so on some like reality TV show, and that's engaging. That's why people want to follow you. But mentioning um, that mentioning things like the league or things like your team and the way that the digital ambassador program does work. I would love to see that more, you know, not just in England, in the United States, in Canada, in Germany, in Sweden, in, in making sure that you're taking that kind of pop culture fun crossover and power and translating it to change, and whether that's supporting a program or your team or, or whatever, but just translating that tremendous power that you have in a way that benefits you, right? Um, so I think that that ambassador program is really innovative, and I think it could be really beneficial not to be instituted for every player, because that's just silly, but the idea of you know players who have an interest in wanting to take that on and build that skill set, because it's definitely a skill set, and do that, I think could be really powerful and help take the excitement and all the followers and um, attention that these players are going to get at the World Cup and translate it into something that benefits them more tangibly than just being you know very well known on social media. And it goes back to something that Carla said today, was that they came in and they had to not only play and win, they had to promote themselves in the game. And that's something she said that, oh, I think she, I don't think she actually said it, but maybe the male players don't necessarily have to do that. And, you know, you being said that you have to sell yourself, and sell the product and stuff that still, it's, I'm not going to say a burden, but it's still an added responsibility that female athletes have to do. In the, in the, in the there's, anyway. there's such significant differences, though, that are like with social media and stuff that's very, so there's a, a digital ambassador, and which is basically like the good representative, the good representative of the game, right? Who helps to promote the league, promote the team, promote the good, like a good, family-friendly, like face of the sport, right? And then you have somebody like Hope Solo who flies off. You know, she's infamous for her every now and again. She has like a Twitter rant, which is also a form of publicity and also generates a kind of an awareness, right? But when I think about like when like I had this kind of really wonderful experience of sitting in the movie theater watching the Douglas Gordon film that's a portrait of Zidane mm -hmm. playing, right? Yeah. Sitting with guys that I play with, that I used to play with, and, and we have like played that weekend together. 
And so sitting up, surrounded by like a team, right, just like people who play the sport, and the, the common language that we had as athletes and how we could enjoy watching Zidane play is because like we've, we've all seen Zidane play and we watch that level of the men's game. And we have a familiarity with the way he moves and an interest in the way in which he moves. And we understand our relationship to the sport partly through that image of like his physical play. And like we wait for these, it's, it's slightly more than four years because we get this around the Olympics. It's like we want that degree of familiarity with the female athlete. Um, and that's the part that's the, that the individual women athletes, they can't give you that. Like they, it's not in their power to actually give you that. All, you know, they can give that on the field um, and, um, and hope that it's a broadcast match. You know, and um, there's a there's a, a distance I think between that because like that broadcast image really does it does so much for um, um, not it's not just for like recruiting new people into the game it's for actually addressing all those people who play the game already and are fans of the game already but don't have uh, means for accessing that particular pleasure except on the field you know like kind of my as a woman player my most accessible form of pleasure in relationship to the women's game is playing the women's game, right, um, and participating locally in it. You know, like, I just think, I just think that there is around the, I'm just trying to say, as a long-winded way of saying that, around the women's game, there's a bigger distance between the lived experience of the game on the field and in the stands watching the live, the live event, right, and our relationship to broadcast culture around the women's game. That those two things are, they're not as seamless as they can be with the women's, the men's game, um, where you have this kind of super saturated world where you get images of men playing like thrown at you quite aggressively all the time around the clock. I don't know what there is for us to do about that, you know, like other than to keep, you know, keep on keeping on, you know, but also maybe to treasure the live event, you know, like which is to, to actually kind of recognize that the live event is itself really the heart of everything and that supporting your local team really does do something, you know. And as a parent and as a player as well, and somebody looks at it in the media, the one you see in the media and just football generally. One way to do that is to encourage and participate as women like ourselves. Like, I mean, encourage absolutely locally and from that grassroots, because that how, that's how it grows. That's how it gets stronger and that's how it gets bigger. There's definitely a place for, for all of that. But I totally agree. And I don't know, vines work. <laughs> like, in terms of Steph Roche's like, yeah. goal, I saw more vines of it than I did anything else. Yeah. But when you're a player, trust me, you have to. Board, you know, make those videos, put those videos out. I, uh, sometimes I wonder if the players know the power that they have. Because I didn't. I mean, I didn't even care about the volunteer work, and I'm all, I'm all into nonprofits and stuff now, but I mean, in college, I could have cared less about that stuff. And even went to the pro, and it wasn't until I was forced to go out to the community and do things, you know, and I started talking and saying things to little kids, and they come up to you like this, and they and you see their reaction to you, and you know they don't know you. You don't know what I did that night. You know, you don't even know. And, but, they, but because of where you are in the position. So, you know, it didn't even matter that I wasn't a starter at the time. It was like I could tell these kids, do your homework, or we were doing summer camps, and then you come back and you, you, see, you, you see the effect you have. And that, and that made me, because I was actually struggling as a soccer player, you know, with a Notre Dame degree, what am I doing for the world? I go out and I kick ball. And I'm in the sun, and it's awesome. But after a while, I'm, and then playing for Mexico, I, I didn't know if I was do, making the right choice. It wasn't like, how am I helping the world just doing this? It, it didn't have any meaning. But once I started to realize that we were the examples uh, for other girls out there to potentially have a dream and say, I want to do that one day, Dad. You know, because we grew up, we're not that, it wasn't that long ago. I grew up and told my parents I wanted to play in the Olympics. And they said, you can't, because it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I said I wanted to be a professional soccer player, and they said you can't. You can't. It stinks to have your your parents tell you can't live your dream, but it didn't exist at the time, and now it does. You know. So sometimes too, we have to look back and realize where we are on that evolution of, of, of our sport, and realize how far we've come. Also, give ourselves applause and a pat on the back, and you know, respect the others that are that are in our communities, and realize like no matter who you are or what part of the puzzle you are in, in growing the women's game. You can contribute, yeah. you know, from the players to the media. It's like we don't have to put those labels on ourselves. To me, we really are part of one team. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. Seems like a good way.
way to end the panel. Yeah, I don't think I need to. Thank you very much to our panel.